We are lucky in Wisconsin to have a large arts community with access to artists across many disciplines. On this episode of the Arts Page, see how a fiber artist combines sustainability with wearable art. Experience one painter's unique way of expressing himself on canvas. Find out how an iconic American company is celebrating a milestone anniversary. And dive into one musical artist's inspiration to visually integrate beauty and nightmares. That's all coming up on this edition of The Arts Page. Welcome to the Arts Page. I'm Sandy Max. We take great pride in the local art we experience every day. Our art community is impacted by all of the artists who call Wisconsin their home. Originally from upstate New York, fiber artist Timothy Westbrook made Milwaukee his home when he was named the 2012 Artist in Residence at the Pfister Hotel. Westbrook's focus on environmental consciousness and fashion may seem like an odd combination until you experience his work. I think at the, the very base of my thought process is that um, there are so many old things that what if we only created all of our new things out of those old things? Because we don't need to make new things out of new things. We have so many things. My name is Timothy Westbrook and I'm a sustainability focused fiber artist. My definition of a fiber artist would be uh, coming from an area of soft sculpture within the world of home-based arts. So thinking knitting, felting, weaving, crocheting, um, all of those craft arts that are very home-based. Um, and then taking them to a point of a performative level. For my prototypes, I use um, old canvas drop cloths and bed sheets. When I'm approached and asked, so what does this mean, sustainability? I love talking about the fact that I don't use electricity and that I don't drive. Um, but uh, you know, obviously you can tell by a light shining on me right now that I do use a little bit of electricity. It's kind of hard to avoid. Um, but it's really about reimagining the expiration date of stuff. Why do we decide when something expires? What that has actually grown out of is a place of interpersonal respect for one another. I'm not a person that would ever put myself first um, or want to put myself in front of anyone else. And sort of the action of throwing something away to, in, in, in my head is sort of saying whoever or whatever has to deal with my garbage is not as important as I am. How we treat one another or, you know, like, oh, that person's just trash, that person's garbage, you know. I mean, we have those phrases in our society and sort of how dare you choose that or how dare you choose to treat someone that way. And I'm feeling that these objects have been abandoned. I try to use things that are the epitome of garbage and waste and trash. So that would be antiquated technologies, uh, specifically the cassette tape. Uh, the next step is weaving with old wires of phone chargers and, and that as well. Um, and then also the plastic bag and then the uh, beer can and aluminum can are, are sort of the third and the trifecta of, of the garbage that I'm working with right now. What I love most about them is their transformative qualities that I'm able to kind of pull out of them. And, and that look that everyone gets when they see the woven cassette tape fabric for the first time. One of the biggest things to think about when you're repurposing the materials is what is the story of what it used to be and how can that inform what it's going to become. Growing up in upstate New York, uh, it just sort of seemed like the trajectory of wanting to be an artist was, okay, go to college and then go to New York City. And uh, I got to college and just really don't, didn't have an interest in going to New York City. I'm really interested in connecting the dots in my work and sort of finding the link from one thing to another. And uh, the loom that I work on, the style of loom that I'm weaving with is a Victorian floor loom and the sewing machines that I use are treadle, non-electric machines um, from the late 1800s, early 1900s. So they're Victorian pieces as well. And I just thought, why not? You know, um, let me just type into the Google machine, Victorian Artist in Residence Program. And the very first th thing that came up was the Pfister Hotel. 
then all of a sudden I was like, oh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and I'm thinking, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And so I type in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and then I'm like looking at pictures of the downtown, like, this is great! And uh, the art scene is just super fantastic, and uh, I just, I absolutely fell in love with it. And so I wrote a letter to the committee that selected the artist in residence, and I said, I didn't understand what I was applying for. Now I do, and I just wrote this whole letter about the community, how uh, I absolutely respect the community that I would be entering and my selection as a finalist, I realized that that's an invitation to be a part of something much bigger than I realized. They ended up uh, inviting me out and over the course of the year from uh, April of 2012 to March of 2013, um, I explored the the art community of Milwaukee and and it really opened up the national art community to me. While I was the artist in residence at the Pfister, uh, this is the first piece that I created there. Um, this is wool with the cassette tape and because it was the first piece and it was a sample dress I worked with all demo tapes. My grandfather is legally blind and it was his being surrounded by his books on tape uh, my whole life that got me thinking about the cassette tape um, and having this really strong relationship with it. So I wanted to work with it and I had um, used it as sewing thread and then I took a weaving course my junior year of college um, and I actually did quite poorly in it <laughs> and, uh, and I, I wove with the cassette tape for the first time um, and it was in my senior year I costumed the Magic Flute Opera as my thesis and one of the characters is Papageno and Papageno is the bird catcher to the Queen of the Night so how could I visually express music? Because his character is you know, calling in the birds with music. Incorporating that into his costume as a woven um, was a way to visually express that sound. Isn't that beautiful? That's just, I mean, I love this color. It's so great. <laughs> I was commissioned to create a pair of ruby slippers. So of course I would go out in search of beautiful sequins and I couldn't find any. So I said I know exactly how I'm going to do this. And I used a Coca-Cola can and then hole punched one by one. Um, and it was a really, really exciting process. The thing about the hole punch can shoes is that um, I really like them as being one of my most hypocritical pieces um, because the adhesive that I put um, the, the sequins on with, that's not sustainable in any way. That's, you know, there's nothing um, that's eco-friendly about that. And I kind of love that about it because it's out of all of these processes I've been describing, that one is, is um, I don't know, sort of heightening the issues. And it, and it sort of um, calls attention to the paradox. Um, and I think that tension in it is, is just really neat for me in the exploration process. So this is the plastic bag graveyard um, and sorting area. <laughs> so um, there are plastic bags that have already been cut into strips um, into making what we in the fiber world call plarn or plastic yarn. My studio mate in college uh, was uh, devastatingly fascinated with the repercussions of plastic bag uh, in our environment. She was just doing beautiful pieces with plastic bags, um, weaving them in different ways, and I was interested in sort of steering that in the same direction that I was using my cassette tapes. And so um, I started weaving with the plastic bag. The most recent project that I just completed was Paleontology of a Woman. Paleontology of a Woman is a fashion show that was presented at the Milwaukee Public Museum. Uh, right in the dinosaur exhibit and it's a whimsical approach to sustainability. It's a way for people to relate to something um, that they enjoy relating to and that's dinosaurs is fun. Everybody can think of some childhood nostalgia with dinosaurs. I love sort of that tongue-in-cheek approach to uh, plastic bags are petroleum-based, petroleum, fossil fuel, uh, fossil fuel, fossils, fossils, dinosaurs. If I could inspire someone else in another field, um, you know, in healthcare or um, in urban renewal, um, if there is a way that the way that I'm thinking about materials can help inspire other people, and uh, that's pretty cool to be able to put those little moments into the world. That's pretty fun. <laughs> Video of Westbrook's recent fashion showcase, Paleontology of a Woman, can be found on YouTube. He's currently working on a project featuring fashion and ice skating to debut in early 2014.
See more about Westbrook's work on his website, unicorns.carbonmade.com, or on his Facebook page. As a young man in Hales Corners, Wisconsin, Jeff Ladow's life took a drastic change when he dove into five and a half feet of water on the first day of summer at age 18. He broke his neck in that diving accident, leaving him a quadriplegic. Ladow hasn't let paralysis prevent him from painting. Here he explains his approach to his art and how he solves creative challenges. Each painting is an achievement and like, you know, setting your goals. And I kind of set them high and I've achieved every goal so far that I sought out to conquer. The goal of becoming a painter was far from the mind of an 18-year-old Jeff Ladau, the cool water beckoning on a warm, sunny day. It was the first day of summer and um, we were going to go scuba diving and while we were waiting for the equipment, uh, we went across the street and swam in the pool a bit and I took a, too deep of a dive into five and a half feet of water and hit the bottom and shattered my neck. Not shattered it, but bruised it mostly. So that left me a quadriplegic, unable to use my hands or my feet. So I was paralyzed. I got a remote control TV. I started to use it to change my channels. I thought, you know, I'm gonna start painting with this too. And I made a mouthpiece by everything you know, I seen. And um, I began just to take small classes. Then I took MATC classes for a while. And then Elena Elke at the Milwaukee Art Museum took me on in her class studying the old masters and painting inside the museum. The process of creating a painting takes a lot of planning. Ladau starts with a series of dots, a technique he developed to get the horizon in the right spot and to set the vanishing points on the canvas. Then he expands to short strokes using a very thin brush. I'll get uh, bits and pieces of what I want to do and sometimes looking art books and see how things are, you know, composed and um, I'll start with a premature it's an undercoat and then with the dots I can do a painting and line it up with the dots to the vanishing point and if something's crooked, at least a dot I can erase real easy where if I do a one line and it's crooked, you know, it's a lot easier to do one little dot than it is to change that whole line. So it's a lot easier. Some of my stuff is real detailed because I am working with such a small brush and smaller canvases help. The larger paintings offer a very different challenge to a mouth painter. Ladau found a way to work around it. On a painting like that, I have to paint sideways, upside down, because my brush will only reach like 12 inches, so you have to be creative and, you know, think of what it's gonna look like upside down and sideways. I can pull the easel closer or further, and I mix my colors right up on my lap with the table I have, so I don't find no disability about it. I just find it as a working career. A career helped in good part by an organization called Mouth and Foot Paint Artist. The main product of the company is cards with motifs painted by the member artist. The MFPA represents 800 mouth and foot painting artists in 70 countries all around the world. The artists receive grants or are taken on as members and receive a regular income for their artistic proficiency. They solely make their money by their sales of the cards and calendars. They don't really 
like to get charity. It's not considered a charity group. We work, we work for our money and we earn it, so makes you feel a lot more gratifying in life. Ladau was a featured artist at the 2013 Great TV Auction for Milwaukee Public Television. To find out more about Ladau and other mouth and foot painting artists, visit their website at mfpausa.com. When it comes to American craftsmanship, none celebrates creativity and freedom quite like Harley Davidson. To celebrate its 110th anniversary, the Harley Davidson Museum in Milwaukee showcased its pride with some unique exhibits for riding fans and friends alike. People get a connection to Harley Davidson that goes beyond just the tangible. Of course, these are motorcycles, they're transportation vehicles, but there's something that goes a lot further beyond just the use of the vehicle. My name is Kristen Jones and I'm the senior curator for the Harley Davidson Museum. The museum came together in 2008, that's when we opened our doors to the public, but the idea for the museum has been around for much longer than that. The, the collection of the Harley Davidson archives has been around since the 19-teens and we have an extensive collection that ranges from the earliest days of the motor company from 1903 to the present time. There's so much here for people to enjoy. Um, some of my particular favorites are the earliest catalogs, uh, some of the galleries that talk about the founding of the company with serial number one, the oldest known Harley Davidson. We have a lot of things that also talk about the culture of riding and the cultural history of riding. Some of my personal favorites are the club uniform jerseys. We also have a lot of different personal stories that we tell in the museum, things about different writers. For instance, a young woman who in 1929 took a solo trip from Georgia to Milwaukee and back. Her name was Vivian Bales, and we have a lot of materials that talk about her story and her personal experience being a young woman on the road alone. This year for the anniversary, we've done a special exhibition entitled Designing a Celebration, and this gives people a behind-the-scenes glimpse into the development of the logos that we use for the celebration and also some of the special products. We do a limited edition motorcycle for each anniversary, and it's a very special piece, highly collectible, and we gave people a glimpse into the design and engineering of that product. There's a real cultural significance to Harley-Davidson, as most of us know. And a lot of that comes from the ideas of personal freedom, the idea of being out on the road, the idea of camaraderie. All of those things are kind of enveloped within our machines. But personalization is also a big deal for Harley Davidson, and that's something I think that resonates with people. We have motorcycles that are highly personalized here, and they range from people who've added just a few things to things that are really rolling sculpture. One of my favorites is the King Kong motorcycle, and this is a double-engine knucklehead vehicle that really is unlike anything I've ever seen before. It's something that was done by a gentleman out in Pennsylvania. He was a real folk artist and created this vehicle to ride it in parades. There are a lot of classic motorcycles here that were used by different personalities. In fact, we have a replica piece from Evil Knievel. Some of the other more familiar bikes that people will see is Captain America from Easy Rider. When someone comes to the museum, they can take their own path. They can really decide what they want to see and when. We have, of course, a chronological display of all the motorcycles, but we also have historical galleries that really put Harley Davidson in the big picture context of what's happening in American culture at the time. Some of the things that they definitely shouldn't miss, of course, are the Tsunami motorcycle, which has a wonderful, poignant story. And this is a bike that floated across the ocean, and a year and one month after the tsunami struck in Japan, it was found on an island off of the coast of British Columbia. And, you know, there's a lot of emotion wrapped up in that piece. Something else that's not to miss, for sure, is our board track display. Now, these bikes were run on wooden tracks that had 45 degree steep banked angles. People didn't have brakes, they were slick with oil, and you can hit up to 100 miles an hour on the straightaways. So, as you can imagine, a very harrowing experience. Harley Davidson is one of those holdouts of our industrial heritage here in Milwaukee. A lot of these companies have come and gone, but we've really kind of stood the test of time. And it's something that I know a lot of people in the community are proud of to have here. Milwaukee played a central role in the growth and development of Harley Davidson. I don't think the founders would have been able to do what they did if they hadn't been in Milwaukee. In fact, in the early part of the 20th century, Milwaukee was known as the machine shop of the world. 
Now the founders were working in a very small shed behind the, the Davidson family home. It was only 10 feet by 15 feet. But they had all of the resources that they needed, machine shops, tanneries, et cetera, right in their own neighborhood. So that really helped to facilitate what they were doing. Harley Davidson, of course, stretches far beyond Milwaukee and has become a worldwide phenomenon. In fact, Harley Davidson was in about 67 countries around the world by 1920. So we really spread our wings outside of the Midwestern United States very early on. And it's not just the fact that these bikes were sold, but the fact that people recognized the brand, people knew that there was something special about the brand, something that went beyond the tangible. We're the only American motorcycle manufacturer who's been around for 110 years. That's a pretty important thing. And it's something that we, we are looking to celebrate. We started our anniversary celebrations really with the 85th anniversary and have continued that tradition every five years. And 110 years, that's a real milestone. For people who are celebrating the 110th birthday of Harley Davidson, the museum is not to miss. The museum is really where all of the history is held. It's the spiritual home of, of Harley Davidson. And you know, it's something that's not to miss. There's so much to see here. People can participate. In fact, one of the uh, most popular exhibits here is a sit-on gallery, what we call the experience gallery, where people can throw a leg over a motorcycle, people who maybe have never even had the opportunity to do so. One thing I would want people to experience upon coming here is that it's not just about the motorcycle. There's so much to see here. There's so much that resonates with people from art history to graphic design to the history of technology. It's more than just a machine. The 20 acre museum campus is open daily for curious visitors and motorcycle enthusiasts to explore. For more information, visit the Harley Davidson Museum's website at h-dmuseum.com. Nick Rhodes is known for his musical success as a founding member and keyboardist of the band Duran Duran. Also a talented visual artist, Rhodes began creating album cover artwork for TV Mania, a musical side project he'd worked on in the mid-1990s with guitarist Warren Cucurillo. He expanded one of these visual concepts into a photographic series that incorporates a unique subject and a very specific approach. For the exhibition, Bay Inkubi, I wanted to strike a balance between beautiful images and more nightmarish images, hence the title which literally translates to beautiful nightmares. The concept was to create a lot of different characters from the same person. I'm always the first to say that a Polaroid is completely unique and I love that format. You can't change anything about it, whatever you take, that's it, one chance, there's your Polaroid. How this exhibition came about was that I was shooting for uh, the TV Mania album cover. I shot all the photographs in one day and I gathered so much material. We looked at it afterwards and said, wow, there's so much more than I need for the album package. I suppose my influences are fairly obvious throughout it, but I've always had a deep affection for surrealism. And so I finally figured out a way that I can create that kind of imagery with my camera. There's a lot of incredible photographers out there working today. A lot of them use Photoshop. And with this, I decided to do virtually everything in camera. I, there is no Photoshop anywhere in the exhibition. Somebody said to me about the image over there, which is the, the, the multiple nurses' faces, which looks very much like a painting. They said, well, you must have Photoshopped that. I said, well, no, I didn't. I, I actually did it with lenses and with filters and colors when I was taking the pictures. This particular series are a little more cinematic. I've always liked photos that look like they're frames from movies, and these, I guess, are more uh, B-movie, fright movie, than anything else. A little film noir.
The Bay Incubi exhibit coincided with TV Mania's album called Bored with Prozac and the Internet. Learn more about the photographs and listen to the music of TV Mania at their website, tvmaniamusic.com. For more information on this week's features, visit our website at mptv.org and click on the Arts page. Or like us on Facebook at the Arts page. On the next edition of the Arts page, we explore the details in art. Find out how a local photographer became connected to iconic Wisconsin breweries. Watch as a sculptor intertwines sewing and welding and find out how one Florida town got its name from a famous movie. I'm Sandy Max, thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next edition of the Arts Page.